Thank you so much. I hope you will allow me to begin with a point of personal privilege. I have a list of the people who were mean to me in high school here. <laughs> and I would like to publicly rebuke them now that I have the microphone and they don't. Beginning with my teachers, no, I... <laughs> So a guy is circling the block, looking for apartment space. And he needs it desperately because this job interview is the job interview, and if he doesn't find a parking space, he's not gonna get the job, and his life will go down the drain. So he looks up at God, and he says, Dear God, if you get me a space, I will start going to synagogue. I will start studying, I will keep kosher, I will keep Shabbat, and just as he says that, someone pulls out right in front of the building. And he says, never mind, I got it. <laughs> now in the space of that joke is the greatest reality of modern American Judaism as represented by this room. Some of you I know, many of you I don't know. But if you're sitting in this room tonight, what I do know about you is that you are among the 99.9% .9 luckiest human beings who have ever lived. And if you're Jewish, you're among the 99.99999% luckiest Jews who have ever lived. To have never gone hungry to live in an age of modern medicine, to live in a free country. We are so used to counting our troubles that we neglect to realize the extravagance of our blessing. And one of the things that I learned when I went to Barak Academy, then Akiba Academy, was that I was lucky to be there. And that that feeling of luck, even though you revolt against it as a kid, because who wants to hear older people tell you you are lucky, it stuck with me. Because it was true. Because this almost endless shower of goodness that we are all beneficiaries of, this is part of what we and those before us have created. And part of our gratitude should be for that creation. After all, every single day we live in buildings we didn't build, heated by air conditioners we didn't create, fed by food we didn't grow, sheltered by a political system that we inherited. And if you don't begin your morning as Judaism teaches us to do, with modeh ani, I am grateful, then you haven't learned the single most important lesson that our school has to teach. I don't feel guilty for being lucky, and neither should you. But I do feel responsible. One of the wonderful things about a school that manages to be a pluralistic school for 70 years, where it doesn't have to say, this is my only community, but all the Jewish community is my community, is that the Philadelphia Jewish community has felt grateful enough to continue to support it and allow it to thrive. And that is, I have to tell you, an incredible achievement. Because it's very hard to be a non-parochial, parochial school. <laughs> and that's what Akiva Barak is. When you go to Barak Academy, you're not going to a school that is of this movement or is for this community. And that stems from this sense of blessing and gratitude. But of course, that was one of the lessons I learned. Another lesson I learned there was, again, in some ways counterintuitive to the Judaism that we too often learn in our schools. 
As you know, it's very easy to teach Judaism as a series of catastrophes. There's a story about the kid who comes home from Hebrew school and his brother was sick and his brother said, I was sick today and go to Hebrew school. What country did we get kicked out of? <laughs> because that's what we used to teach. On Tuesday, they kicked us out of France and on Thursday, Russia. But the truth is that we speak in our tradition of simcha shal mitzvah, the joy of a mitzvah. And our fundamental approach to the world is one of joy, not one of mourning. You're about to enter Pesach. You begin in sadness, but you end in celebration. I'll give you an example, only because many of you were kind enough to ask about my mother. My mother many years ago had a stroke. It's very difficult for her to speak, sometimes almost impossible. But she still has this attitude, and I will illustrate it with this story. Several years ago, when she reached her 80th birthday, my brothers and I took her out to dinner. And at the end of the dinner, we all reached for our wallets and took out our credit cards. And my mother looked around at us and she went, no. And we thought, oh my God, is it possible that she's gonna pay for us to go to dinner? But you don't argue with your mother, especially when you know that saying no is not easy. So we all put away our wallets and she waited for a second and looked at us again and said, dessert. <laughs> That's joy. <laughs> That's the sense that we really should have that after all, we are so incredibly fortunate to live in this world. And just as the rabbis say that if you eat something and you don't make a blessing, you're a thief, because all God wants as payment for that food is the blessing. They also teach in the Talmud, in the Yerushalmi, that everything you see in this world that is beautiful and wonderful and you don't take advantage of, it's a crime. And we should celebrate together and be joyous together. Yes, every life has difficulties and trials and pains. We all know that. We've all had tragedy that either has visited us or sadly will. But I walked in this evening and saw this beautiful hall and saw, like at every Jewish event, a ridiculous abundance of food <laughs> that could feed a small village. And I saw people who haven't seen each other for a long time. And I thought how lucky we are. And how I learned those lessons early and I learned them, I want to say here, not so much at the Kimmel Center, but <laughs> here. And that those lessons are enduring and they follow you throughout your life. Girsa de Yankuta, the Talmud calls it, the version of your youth, when it's implanted young, that you are lucky, you are blessed. You shouldn't feel guilty for feeling joyous. That's what you're supposed to do in this world. It stays with you. And that's good. But of course, we aren't only grateful and joyous. The other thing that Barak taught me when I was young was that we're not all. And what I mean by that is whatever you think theologically, whatever God is or isn't to you, there was a sense that we're part of an enterprise that is something greater than ourselves. That to believe you're all that matters in this world is profoundly un-Jewish. And to see the face of the other and to care for them and to understand that both are part of something infinitely greater, that's what it means to be a Jew. There's a passage in the Torah that I probably learned a long time ago in a class that I wish I remembered having. <laughs> where God is visiting Abraham, and Abraham turns away from God to greet the three strangers that are coming to his tent. And so the Talmud noticing this says, it teaches you that it's more important to greet the stranger than Kabbalat Pnei Hashkinah, than even to greet God's presence. It's a beautiful lesson. 
But along in the 19th century came the Ger Rebbe and he said, I understand that we know that it's more important to greet the stranger than greet God's presence because Abraham did it. But how did Abraham know? How did Abraham have the chutzpah? How did he have the gumption, the arrogance, the goal to turn away from God and say hello to people that were wandering close to his tent? And this was his answer. He didn't do it in spite of being in God's presence. He did it because he was in God's presence. Because to feel you're in God's presence is to want to do a mitzvah, is to want to reach out to another human being. And one of the things that you do when you send your children to a Jewish school is you teach them that they're not all that matters. They matter infinitely, but they're not all that matters. And that to reach out, to create a community, to give to those who are hungry and tired and poor and scared and alone and bereaved and bereft, that's what it is to be Jewish. You don't learn that in most places that are only concerned that you should have the technical skills and the educational skills to be a success. Do we want our kids to be successes? Of course we do. But we want wealth with responsibility. We want success with compassion. We want neshama. We want people who are successful and soulful. And that's what our school teaches. And it creates community. You can tell it creates community because when you come back to a place like this, it's not like, oh my God, look at this, this was my high school. It's, this is my community. These are the people I grew with whose lives I'm still intertwined with. I told a story not so long ago in Philadelphia about something that happened in Los Angeles, but it is a beautiful example. When I first came there, I heard the story. There's a building in Los Angeles that is the Federation Building, 6505 Wilshire. And when I first came there, I heard the story that a couple of years before, so now almost 25 years ago, in the middle of the night, a call came in to the Federation Building. And it was a little girl with an accent, and she said, my dad has fallen and he can't get up. So the operator who handles the switchboard in the middle of the night, she read the emergency instructions. It said if an emergency comes in, call 911 and then call the Federation president. So she calls 911 and then she calls the president of Federation. President of Federation goes to the hospital, finds a little girl, and they sit there. The father had had a heart attack, he recovered. And she says to her, why'd you call the Federation? And she said, we're immigrants from Russia, and we've only been here for a few months. And my father put a number on the refrigerator, and he said, if anything bad ever happens, call this number. It's the Jewish building. They'll help you. I think about that all the time. Every time I pass a Jewish building, Barak is the Jewish building. They'll help you. That's what we do. We feel blessed. We're joyous. We know that other people matter, that they're real, that they're not phantoms, that their sufferings are real, that their joys are real. And we create community. We do it together. You know, when I was asked to come here, one of the things that inevitably happens every time someone says, since you're the class of such and such, you think that was a long time ago. And it doesn't feel that long ago because a lot of memories start to come rushing back of things you did <laughs> that you ought not to have done <laughs> and experiences you had and the sense that I had that I think most of my classmates had, and I hope people who go to barracks still have, which is 
that this is a home as well as a school. And that you're part of that village that will always care for you wherever you go through life. And that we will never entirely let each other go because we're Jews and we just don't do that. And that we have a community here and in Eretz Israel, and in fact throughout the world, and like many of you, I have traveled through the world and everywhere you go, there are Jews with open doors and open arms and open hearts. But the thing that I think of most are what Wordsworth called the little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love. I think of words that were spoken to me by a teacher in this grade or by a classmate in that one. Because remember, everybody here has had people say something to them that changed their lives. And you might not remember, and you may never go back to that teacher in seventh grade and say, you know, this thing you said to me, I never forgot it. But you know it's true, and if it's been done to you, know that you have done it for others. And that's, more than anything else, what the memory of a real education is about. It's about those few words that I remember Mrs. Howarth saying to me in Hebrew class when I was failing. <laughs> they were kind words, but she still failed me. <laughs> it's about the encouragement of the coach as you're slipping down the rope. It's about the kindness of your friends when they know you have trouble. It's about community. If you want to know what the Jewish people are in their soul, in their core, I take you back to the oldest bit of Torah that exists in the world. I don't know if you're aware of this, although if you've ever gone to the Israel Museum, you can actually see it. About 30 years ago, Israeli archaeologists began to excavate in the valley right outside the walls of Jerusalem called Gehinom, Gehenim, which, as you may know, is the Jewish word for hell. And that's where, in ancient times, pagans would sacrifice children, and that's why Jews called it Gehenim. And there were these Israeli archaeologists excavating in Gehenim. And they came upon the oldest bit of Torah that we have intact in the world. Two rolled up silver amulets. And they spent years unrolling them with all sorts of chemical appliances without doing any damage so that they could still read them. And when they unrolled them, this is what they said. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God be with you and grant you peace. In other words, the oldest statement of the Jewish people to the world is a blessing of peace that is snatched from hell. If you look back on the 20th century of our people, that's where we were and that's what we did. And this place, this school, these people are what will teach our children and our children's children that no matter what the world says about us, that's who we are. That we are the heirs of Moses and Isaiah and Deborah, and Ruth, and Maimonides, and Herzl, and Ben-Gurion. That words of our prophets are written on the walls of the most universal institution in the world, the United Nations, are words from Isaiah. That when the world wants to express itself, it remembers that, as the poet Heine said, freedom speaks with a Hebrew accent. That's who we are. Hebrew Academy, Barak Hebrew Academy, our Hebrew Academy, a place 
that teaches the world the soul of a Jew, I feel grateful and blessed that I got the chance to be a student there. And so grateful and blessed that you asked me back to tell you about me, about you, about us, about our school, and about our people.